we do have two protocols. Partially edentulous patient and totally edentulous patients. You shared with me uh, the um, cases of partially edentulous patients. Yeah. So we, we will see how we can work on partially edentulous patients, but I want to, you to understand that we can work equally effectively on total edentulous patients. Okay? So we do have two protocols for partially edentulous patients. And it's very much, these two protocols are very much driven by uh, the, uh, uh, the CBCT. Either you have in office a CBCT or you don't. In your case, you don't. Okay. Yeah. So if you had a CBCT in the office, you could work with the protocol, which boils down in creating a, an occlusal key and placing a, with a thermoplastic material and placing on top of it this radiopaque device. So patient gets scanned with this radiopaque device. And because you see there are rods here, one long and one short, and these are in titanium. When you do import dicoms into Navident, the software detects the rods and find the rods on the patient's anatomy. And it does register the patient anatomy on the CBCT. This process, which is a critical process, is called registration. And it means that you need to be sure that the anatomy of the patient is well represented by the CBCT. So this is essential. In this case, what you do, you do a scan, a CBCT scan with this device in the mouth. Okay. We okay. understand. Uh, in, uh, in our case, we need to put the this device. Yeah, but, but let me go ahead a little more explanation because what, what's the snag of this pro? What is a, a problem of this protocol? The problem of the protocol is that you have to delegate the positioning of this device to a third party, maybe a radiologic center. Yeah. You, you are not sure 100% that they will be abiding to the protocol. So the drawback of this protocol is that you very much delegate to a third party the correct positioning of this device. If this device doesn't sit passive on the patient's mouth, then we will have problems. We have issues. OK, so okay. In your case, you don't have a CBCT. So you might well decide, but you need to be aware about the opportunity, decide to forego this option and go straight to the other option. What is the other option? You work with the tracer. You do have a tracer. Yes. And before surgery, not at the time of planning. This is a long arrow. Before acting on the patient, what you do? You pick up points, in other words, you pick up, uh, you know, threshold, trigger points on the patient's anatomy, and that's points got to be a tripod. So you need to take a molar, two molars, premolars or canines, and then an incisor, if it's possible, or a lateral, or mm -hmm. a canine. But you need to go for a tripod. You need first to identify which are the suitable teeth for the specific patients, and you pick up the teeth before tracing, then using a tracer that you know, it's a, it's a probe, you will touch a trigger point for one second, stay put for one second, and then the software opens up a window where you need to trace, you need to draw the surface of the tooth 100 points. So by drawing at the surface, you collect 100 points and the surface is not just vestibular, has to be, you know, a volume, not a plane. So it has to be a, a vestibular, 
you know, plate, but also clusal and lingual. You need to trace the tooth on a volume based. The end point of this ex exercise is that the software matches your drawings, the volume drawings that you drew with the volume that he finds in the 3D rendering of the patient. And in that way, you basically get the registration. In one case, you inserted a radiopaque device on the patient mouth, while in this case, you're using the radio, radiopacity of the teeth, because in enamel, it's radio opaque, you leverage on the radiopacity of the enamel in order to achieve the same result. What's the difference in this case? It's under your control because you perform the tracing before surgery. You don't need to do it uh, one day, two days, three days before. You do it uh, just in a few minutes before the surgical act. So that's, that's the difference between the two. Then in both cases, what you need to do, you need to plan. You need to draw a nerve, you need to understand the anatomy, you need to position an implant, you need to do whatever is needed uh, in order to perform properly, you know, a planning. But once the planning uh, is for you, it's fine, and you do the planning using Navident, if you go first to the tracing, uh, you go tracing first, and then what you do, you do accuracy check. So after each procedure, it's mandatory to do a test. And the test carried out shows if you've done good job or a bad job. You cannot assess the quality of the job by yourself. You need, to, you need to have a test which suggests if you carried out properly the procedure or not. And what is a, the accuracy check? The accuracy check about? It's simply you will touch with any tip, in this case might be a tracer tip, a cusp, in this case, you know, a surface of a tooth, and you should see the same cusp touched on the laptop on the on the laptop screen. In other words, there should be congruency between what you do and what you see. If there is a congruency, it means that the system is set. It's, for example, you touch a cusp and the software and, the, and basically the computer screen shows you that you are away from that cusp, then there is an incongruency. It means there is an error. And you need to fix the error before getting to the surgery. So accuracy check is a very powerful test that you need to carry it out in order to assure yourself that everything is set. And when you get when you have to carry out such a test, each time you finish a procedure. So after finishing the tracing, you touch the cusp and see that everything is accurate. After finishing calibrating uh, the drill axis and the length, sorry, the, the contrangle axis and the length of the drill, then of course you need to do accuracy check. And again, if it's congruent, in other words, you see what you do, can carry up, you can carry on. If there is a gap, then it means there is an error and you need to fix the error. How to fix the error? You need to repeat the procedure till the test is positive. Until test is positive, you you're sure that everything is said, you move on to surgery. But without congruency, without a positivity of the test, you are not allowed to move on to surgery. So this is a, a very important concept uh, to be understood, accuracy test. Then there is another concept uh, which is equally important uh, to be understood. And the other concept is that you do have optical targets and optical targets are necessary for dynamic navigation. And you have an optical target for the patient, and you have an optical target for your contrangle. 
you cannot have an optical uh, uh, target on the contrangle and nothing on the patient, or vice versa. You should have an optical target on the patient, optical target on the contrangle, or any surgical tool you're going to be using. So that's a very important thing. And what are those for the patient? As you can see, we do have uh, for the upper jaw, we do have a head tracker. So something that you position on the nose and behind the, the ears in order to let the software track patient's movement. By why we're we putting this on the forehead? Because of the upper jaw, it's attached to the skull. So by moving the skull, you move the upper jaw. But the mandible, as you can see, it's free, it's loose. So you need to have some optical target specific for the mandible. And what are these optical targets? There are a couple of options. One like this one, you can light cure with flow and composite. Or there is another one, U-shaped at the end, where you can put liquid silicone for registration. You mm -hmm. let it dry, then you use it uh, as, again, uh, a way to anchor the optical target uh, on the patient jaw. So once you fix, you know, the optical target on the patient jaw, and once you fixed, you know, the optical target uh, on your contrangle, then you can move on to, and then you carried out the accuracy check and everything is positive, then you can move on to surgery. And surgery, as you know, it's seeing in real time what you do on the patient anatomy. And there are two modes of operating. One mode, if you operate by planning an implant, as you can see here, not only the surgeon plan the implant, but import an STL file, because you can see the width of the soft tissue, and import it as well a walks up, because you can see the shape of a tooth here. So in this case, planning uh, took place with these two pieces of information. And now, basically, the surgeon drills alongside an axis, which is at the same axis that he planned. And the center of the target, it's that axis. But there is a second mode of operating uh, without any plan. And the way of operating, uh, you do not plan any implant. So you go straight by drilling in the area in which you want to drill. And in this case, you see exactly what you do on the patient anatomy. So either case, you will be guided uh, to see in real time what you do on the patient anatomy. So this is a partially dentrous patient. Have you got any questions? Uh, the question is, is uh, what uh, kind of uh, silicone we need to to fix say, fix the trainer? So in in, the, in this case, you do have either a, a flow a composite or yeah, or a silicone. The silicone it's uh, like uh, the Voco liquid silicone for registration, or the 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 composite it's the Voco dual composite, uh, which means a syringe which mix flow and composite. But okay. it's not necessarily a VOCO solution. I know VOCO is the best product, uh, but you can uh, use other brands as well. But you need to use a flow and composite on one hand, and you have to use on the other hand a liquid silicone which stiffens up in order to fix and anchor the optical target uh, on two, three teeth. You better to have in those teeth, two, three teeth, at least one premolar or one molar in order to have a stable position of the target in the patient's mouth. In our case, uh, we have a patient, uh, Lihachova Aurika. We need to put in the right side or the left side? So that's that's a good question. So you want to put the optical target not on the site of surgery. So let's say that you need to operate on the rear, four, five on the third and fourth quadrant. Of course, you want to place it in the center because uh, 
on the on the third and fourth quadrant, you're going to be operating. So you need to be, you know, uh, uh, you need to have easy access on the rear of the jaw. But let's imagine that you have uh, to operate in the center. You need to place a canine or you need to place an incisor. Again, for the lower jaw. Of course, you need to place it either on the left side or on the right side. Okay. In conclusion, uh, we need to put in the opposite side. Yeah. I mean, that's very much also linked to if you are right handed or you are left handed. Right. Because uh, you need always to be aware that those optical targets need to be read by the cameras, by the macron tracker cameras, the, photo, the stereo photogrammetry cameras. So for, okay. effect, for example, if you are right handed and you need to work, let's say, on an incisor, let's say you need to work on a 41 incisor, of course, you could put it uh, on the right side, but but because of uh, you are right-handed, your hand might hinder the good reading of this optical target from the cameras. So if you're right-handed, it's better to put it uh, on the, the third quadrant if you're operating uh, on a 41. Okay. That's, that's so that is not cast in stone. It's something that you need to assess, taking into account the fact that the cameras needs to read these optical targets. And therefore, nobody, nor yourself, nor your assistant, by, you know, with a suction, for example, uh, have to cover these optical targets. If those optical targets are covered, then, of course, there's no connection with the cameras, the, no dynamic uh, navigation takes place. So this is a, something that you need to be aware of. Of course, if you're talking about an upper jaw, it's a little bit easier because are you taking uh, this optical target uh, extra orally altogether and you don't have anything in the mouth. You can operate freely both on the first and the second quadrant. But again, this can be done for the upper jaw, which is attached to the skull, but cannot be done for the lower jaw, which is loose. Okay. Okay, sorry, one more question. About the the points, the, <clears throat> the targets that we, put, that we put on the teeth, the tripod that you talked about. Yeah. Yes, you talked about uh, drawing on the surface of the teeth with... Uh, a tracer. Yes, yes, yes. How exactly, how should we do that correctly? So this is a very important question. And that's, uh, uh, it's, uh, you need to be aware that it's essential once you calibrate <laughs> the tip of the tracer, and you will calibrating uh, same as a drill, placing the tip of the tracer on uh, this point of the tracer, of the calibrator, so point number two, and by calibrating the tip of the tracer, you enable the software understand that you're working with the tracer, you're not working with a, a contrangle and a drill. So first of all, you need to calibrate the tracer. Let the software know that you are using a tracer. Secondly, you need to touch with the tip of the tracer the trigger point that you identified on the panoramic, on the 3D rendering of the day of the patient. So you will stay put one second on that trigger point, and the trigger point should be a cusp. Why should be a cusp? Why should be a cusp? Because uh, basically, cusp is an azimuth, so it's a point. And it's easily, I can easily find one point on an azimuth. Uh, um, so, so on the top of, uh, you know, of a curve, uh, which I think is not an azimuth, it's zenith. Maybe zenith is the, the correct word. But if you take a point on a flat surface, to find that point as a trigger point is more challenging because you need to find that point on a flat surface, which is wide. So you always want to get a cusp as a trigger point because the cusp is e easily touched by your tracer. And you need to touch the trigger point and stay put for one second. So in that regard, you will go after cusps. Which cusps? 
that's your choice. But the choice is given by the fact that you want to have a tripod. You don't want to have uh, three points aligned. Because if you choose three points aligned, then the registration gets shaky. But if you take three points on a tripod, then the software can easily register those three points onto the 3D rendering of the patient. Okay, so by, by tripod, you mean uh, we should choose uh, one cusp, uh, which would be on the vestibular side, for instance, for the second molar? No, no. By tripod, I intend two molars and incisor. So look at my hand. So you get two molars, tripod. and tripod. above you have an incisor. This is a tripod. Okay, or okay. you should go for two premolar and incisor. But if you don't have premolars or you don't have uh, incisor, you will go with uh, whatever is a uh, rear, might be even, uh, you know, uh, two canines, if you just have canines, and then an incisor. So depending on what's available on the patient mouth, you will pick up a tripod. And when you're going to be scanning uh, with the tracer, you will be starting always from right to left, never from left to right. So the first trigger point that you would be tracing, it's the first on the right. And then the second, it, it follows a sequence which starts always right to left. Okay. Okay, so so we we should we can imagine, for instance, that this is the vestibular side of a premolar. This is the cusp. We put the trigger point here. Yeah. Yes, and then we 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 take the tracer and we do it like that, or no? No, you need to take uh, the full volume while you're tracing. Uh, you cannot stick to a surface, let's say vestibular surface, because this is a plane. It's not a volume. You want to draw a volume, meaning that while you trace, you will trace, you collect point on the vestibular side, on the occlusal side, and on the lingual side. Because by tracing these three areas, you will get a volume. If okay. you to the vestibular side, you don't get a volume. You, you, get, you get a plane. And the software has much more difficulties in matching a plane with a volume he will need to, to register a volume with a volume. Okay. okay, 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 thank you. Yes. Are there other questions on this protocol? At the moment, we don't have. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's explore the second, which is a the totally edentulous patient. <laughs> because as you know, Navident works perfectly for all different uh, uh, you know, cases, uh, you know, you can uh, work uh, with total dentures patient, you can place a uh, zygomatic implant, pterygoid implants, nasal implants. So you can work on uh, cases which are more challenging because of the shortage of volume, bone volume on the patient. And again, the advantage of using Navident, you pinpoint the limited volume in order to place the implant and also to have an implant which is congruent to the project to the project of prosthesis that you will have for the patient because this is a, a prosthetic driven surgery so total dentures patient because of uh, our prosthetic driven surgeries need to be prepared in advance before the, the cbct scanning in which may, in which sense we need to have a walks up of what you're going to be fixing on the patient mouth. This is uh, advisable. So the technician, based on uh, your, uh, you know, uh, the, the jaws that you you basically, you can uh, you can scan using an intralar scanner and you provide uh, the technician with the two jaws and the two jaws are put by the technician on uh, a virtual articulator. And by placing those two jaws on a virtual articulator, it will uh, determine uh, the vertical dimension of the teeth and the width and the volume of the teeth. And this, of course, is uh, the ideal prosthetic 
what you're gonna be ideally fixing on the patient mouth. And of course, you don't know what is the bone of the patient, but at least you start by looking at what is the ideal prosthesis for the specific patient. Then you need to replicate the WOXAP using a, as a, as a mock-up, as a, a radiologic prosthesis. And basic, if you see this mock-up, has dots on it. And those dots are radio opaque. Those dots are radio opaque. In other words, you need to have something in the volume because these are extruding dots. They are not flat, but you can see they are extruding out of the mock-up. And they are radio opaque meaning that uh, when they're going to be scanned, CBD scanned, they will be visible on the CBCT. Then you do have uh, this kit, this surgical kit, which they used to make the kit. So this is not necessarily, no, it's not mandatory to use East, used to med, but uh, used to med has the advantage to be fully recognized by an evident. So these screws, these mini screws are, get fully recognized and therefore provide some benefit uh, uh, for you in the, in the stage, during the stage of, uh, of tracing. So you're going to place minimum four mini screws. These are bone fixation screws, and you're going to place two on, on each semi-arch. Two on the left, two on the right. With this preparation, the patient gets scanned. Okay, once scanned, you don't need to operate the day of scanning. Once scanned, you can send your patient home. Why? Because basically, basically you have the opportunity to leave these mini screws on the, uh, on the, on the jaw, and basically those, those can stay easily for four or five days without the risk of osteointegration, of course. Mm -hmm. The attention that you need to pay is that those screws need not to be pushed by the pontic, by the, you know, whatever the patient has in his mouth. And if there's any risk of uh, a pressure sore on the screw, you need to curb the pontic in order to uh, you know, uh, avoid any contact, any possible contact between the mini screw and the pontic, because those mini screws need to remain in the exact same position until the end of the surgery. So that's essential. So no need to operate the day of CBCT. Patient can go and do the CBCT and get back with DICOMs, and you can operate uh, in a few days. If this is your wishes, that's possible. No big deal, no problem. <clears throat> While, because uh, once you're going to be starting uh, cases like this, are difficult cases to be planned. So you need to have time to think what would be the treatment plan in this case. And what you see, th this is a, what you see with Navident. You will see the mini screw. Look at here. You see yeah, the yeah. mini screws on the bone. In this case, the mini screws are occlusal because there are no teeth. But you can have the mini screws, same mini screws, vestibulary on the flanges. If there is a, a, a pontic, you can place those four mini screws vestibulary below the flanges of, uh, of a pontic. Then you see these dots. These dots are exactly the dots that we've seen on the mock-up. Those dots are visible because those dots are radio opaque, meaning that you can see them easily from the CBCT. And you will use exactly the same dots, use the same dots to register the STL because this is the STL which has been provided by your lab technician. It's an STL which has dots. The same dots of the mock-up have been scanned 
using an intraoral scanner, for example, or a desktop scanner, and you can see easily the same dots on the STL file extruded on the STL file. So what you're going to be doing, you're going to register the STL file by using the dots. So you will pick one dot on the STL, click, then another dot on the DICOM, click a second dot on the STL, a second dot on the DICOM, a third dot on the STL, a third dot on the DICOM, and then after three dots, and can be more, but three are the minimum, you register the STL file onto the DICOM files. And this is essential for you to plan properly your implants. Why? Because now you don't have only the bone volume. Now you have the width of the soft tissue and you have also the, le the vertical length and the volume of the tooth. And so now you can place your implant, in this case you see the synthetic implant and uh, according uh, to the exact uh, 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 prosthesis that you would like to fix on the patient's mouth. And that's the planning. And the planning doesn't take five minutes like it might it might occur with a partially dentous patient. In this case, you might develop one, two, three different treatment plans and eventually choose along with the patient what is the most suitable treatment plan for him or for her. So after the planning, then you move on to surgery. And again, what you do, you're going to first use the screws, the mini screws, to register patient's anatomy on the CBCT. And how is it all about? You've already seen how it works tracing. You use a tracer and you touch the head of the screw. And because the screw is acknowledged as a, a used to made screw, it takes one second for the software to identify this volume. And it will register the volume of the screw that it finds on the DICOM files with the volume of the, of, the, of the screw that he knows from the library. So it takes these five screws, it takes five seconds to register the upper jaw. I touch you with my tracer screws head, get registered, one second, another screw head registered, one second, third screw head, and again, I always start from right to left. So third screw's head registered, fourth screw's head registered, fifth screw's head registered, five seconds, the software does the registration. And what you need to do, of course, it's accuracy check. So you need to touch with your tracer any of these screw's head, and you should be congruent. You should see the same screw's head touched by your tracer. If there is congruency, it means that you can move on. If there is a problem, in other words, there is a gap between uh, the tracer, the screw's head, something went wrong, and that, that error needs to be fixed before moving on. If everything is positive, then of course, what you do, you start tracing. You start the drilling. Again, drilling in this case means you see, you see a target, if you plant implants, and the center of the target is the axis of the plant implant. And you want to stay into the center because by staying into the center and keep drilling along with the center, you're going to be drilling along the plant axis. Are there any questions on this protocol? <laughs> it's very, it's very, uh, at the moment it's very difficult. Why, why is difficult? Let me, let me, tell me why you feel it's difficult. But uh, we need to fixate the screws uh, and the, uh, another tools. Okay, so, okay, at, at the so moment. The, the, if, you the don't have teeth, if you don't have teeth, you can place a crucially. But if you have to, you have teeth that you need to sacrifice the day the surgery, of course you need to place the screws 
in a way that don't, don't uh, hinder with the teeth. But the good, the, the important thing to be remembered, those screws should be kept along, along the whole procedure, because you will be using the same screws for accuracy checking, you know, the drill changes. You're gonna change your drills. Then how are you gonna check if everything is set? You will check that everything is set by touching with your drill the head of the screws. And you see again congruency between what you do and what you see. And that will enable you to perform a guided surgery dynamically, but it's 100% accurate and it's 100% under your control. Luca, uh, we need to found the uh, uh, patients uh, totally dangerous. So, my my suggestion, and again, you send me uh, three, pa three patients. Special, special defect. Th three patients which are partially dentulous. Yes. Okay. So my suggestion, let's uh, uh, let's work also on a total dentulous patient. So my suggestion, because you don't have a CBCT in office, yeah, you can use the tracer trace and place for the partially dentures. So the only requirement, the only requirement it's for a, a trace and place patient is to have the patient scanned with the two archers split. You don't want an overbite because if you do have an overbite, you, you lose vertical dimension and you lose the, the trigger points because the, the, the upper jaw, it's overbiting the lower jaw. So you cannot anymore trace a lower jaw teeth. So you, the requirement for referring a patient to a Navidan trace and place, partially dentures, it's purely and simply taking the two jaws. How you can do it? Either they have, uh, you know, the bite, if they have uh, an a CBCT with a bite, or eventually you just ask them and they have, imagine that they have only the chin holder. You ask them to, to put cotton rolls, one on the left, one on the right, in order to split the two arches. Another important requirement that we found that the, the, the radiologic center have difficulties with is that because of they are not used to work with uh, uh, they're not they're not used working with Navident. They provided they providing uh, files with a viewer. So instead of providing you the set the set the data set of DICOMs, they provide you a viewer which reads a proprietary set of images which enables you to see the patient uh, and analyze the anatomy of the patient. But this is not what we need. We need to upload the DICOMS files in, onto Navident. So we do need to have DICOMS, not viewer at all. And yes, yes, only, we don't have this problem. Not only we need to have DICOM, but we need to have a multi-slide DICOM data set. So not one single file collecting all the DICOMS, but we need to have one file, each slide, each act the um, actual slide of that patient. So that's that's a requirement. Okay. Okay. So, so if you want to um, treat a total edentious patient, of course, you're welcome. But in order to treat it, uh, what we suggest, what we suggest, it's to follow this procedure. Of course, there are colleagues of yours because of a constraint of time or whatever reason, they do not plan to register an STL file. They just plan the implants and they use, you know, the artificial teeth that the Navident library provided them in order to plan a, a hypothetical prosthesis. But what's the difference between the artificial teeth Navident has in its library and the registration of an STL file? that this STL file has been designed by the technician 
on a virtual articulator. So it took into account the antagonist. So all the occlusal points have been planned properly on this STL file. While if you use the artificial teeth, which are provided with Navident, there is no information about antagonist, and therefore the vertical dimension and the width of the, of the tooth, it's arbitrary. It's not exactly the one that you necessarily will end up. So in, a, in certain circumstances, uh, maybe because of uh, the hasting uh, to the end of surgery, whatever, some of the colleagues uh, plan the implants, use the artificial teeth, and then they hastily go to surgery. But our recommendation, possibly, is to follow a proper way of working. And the proper way of working from our viewpoint is to have a, a walks up of the ideal prosthesis and then registering the walks up in, S2, in a, a STL file into DICOMS. This is a, what we suggest. Secondly, what we suggest is we, using a Ustomed uh, kit, because the Ustomed kit, uh, it's a kit, of course, which is not disposable. Those mini screws, once used and once the procedure is over, you can unscrew the mini screws, cleanse and sterilize, and then use again for the next patient. So the kit will last until we, you will lose all the screws, or your assistant uh, will lose uh, all the screws. But this is practically, potentially, eternal. You don't need to buy one kit uh, per patient, of course. You need just one and properly manage uh, the screws. And here, yeah, the kit includes a screwdriver, and there's also a couple of drills, pilot drill, in order to work with the, with the mini screws, because these mini screws are flat on the on the end. They are not tapered, they are not pointed. So they eventually will need a, a mini screw, a, sorry, a, a, a one point, uh, one point one millimeter uh, width of a drill as a pilot. And then you're gonna be using uh, the mini screws and the, the screwdriver to fix it on the bone. And the mini screws varies in length from six millimeters to eight to 11 millimeters and have a width of 1.5. So these are the mini screws that we suggest. If you used any other screws, which is a possible, again, this is not a mandatory, you can use any screw. Again, those screws you, reason, you will trace on the head using a tracer collecting 100 points and then moving on to another screws, collecting 100 points and so on, so forth. Okay, while again, by using Ustomed, they get immediately detected, you touch it one second and it gets registered. So that's that's the difference by using a Ustomed kit, comparing a, that with another kit. Okay, uh, Luca, uh, can uh, we try uh, the next week uh, of one patient and uh, you share the, the, share the treatment? Is sure. possible? Sure. sure. Okay. Okay, one more question. Uh, for instance, for the three patients that we prepared, the partially dentulous. Yeah. Yes, uh, you told me in the message on WhatsApp that uh, we should uh, make uh, the CBCT for them on Sunday if we plan to make the surgery on Monday. Yes. No. So if you if you're gonna apply if you're gonna apply the trace and place protocol, which is basically the one that uh, I understand you are willing to uh, use, you can do whenever you want the CBCT. Because uh, then you can operate by tracing first and then placing implants secondly. So you don't need to do it one day before. You can do it tomorrow. Usually we recommend that the CBCT to be younger than 30 days. Younger than 30 days. Okay. If you exceed 30 days, then there is no there is no assurance that the anatomy will stay put on the same way. But if you do a CBCT and you operate within a 30 days, that's fine. So those cases, as long as you get the CBCT with two arches split, you can do it tomorrow. And then we can operate, uh, I can support you operating uh, when we're gonna meet meeting uh, in, uh, in Moldavia. 
Okay, uh, I read in the user manual about the Navi tray. Yes. The Navi tray is the 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 radio peak device which I showed you on the partially dangerous protocol. Yes, 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 yes. And for instance, for the first patients, until we kind of train the radiography office that we are currently partners with, I'll be joining the patients and I'll, I'll be helping them to make the CBCD right so that we can use it for the for the surgeries that we plan. So yeah, I, but it's up to you. Are you willing to test the Navi tray? Or you prefer to work using a trace in place? Because if you want to place, you know, in the Navi tray, for those cases, you need to be, you know, you need to accompany the patient, the radiology center, and be sure that yes. everything is under control. And I'm assuming that it's a daunting task to accompany a patient each time to take a CBCT. It's much more easier and faster applying trace in place few minutes before surgery, asking a simply and purely a standard CBCT with the two split arches. So if this is going to be the protocol that you're going to apply on the day-to-day -day activity in your practice, then there is no way to test for you Navi tray. Then you just need to, to practice tracing and become, you know, very any proficient in tra in tracing. Yes, yes. The standard of the, the gold standard for for your practice. This is a decision that you need to take. I only presented the two options, and presented the, the advantages and disadvantages of both protocols. Okay, so uh, so I should I can understand correctly. Navi tray is for in office CBCTs and trace and place is when uh, the CBCT is out of office. Yes, exactly. The preferred that's, protocol. That's what we recommend. Okay, so for the CBCT, one more time, we just need the arches a little bit uh, distant, separated one from the other. Yes, exactly. And you can achieve it uh, either by uh, using a CBCT with a bite. Some of them have a bite, so patient needs to bite. And therefore, the two arches split. But if there is no bite, there's only the chin holder. You need to have a cotton rolls in order to split the two arches. Okay. And then you need to ask the exportation of diapers. Yes, yes. Okay. And then, of course, you're going to be planning. We're going to planning. You're going to be going to using artificial teeth and so on and so forth. If you want, and if you have a patient, willing, uh, you know, uh, to be your first patient uh, for total dangerous cases. Uh, we can definitely have it so you can uh, identify that, that patient and we can share together how we're going to procedure, how, how we, we, we're going to proceed applying this protocol on that patient. Okay. Capito. Very well, very well. Have you got any other question, any doubt, any any other suggestion, uh, whatever? For now, uh, we don't. But if we if something appears, I'll just write to you on WhatsApp. OK, that would be lovely. Meanwhile, I wish you happy Easter. And uh, we will be touching base uh, next week. Yes, again. I Thank will you. be ne next week. I will be um, we, we're going to be doing a, a cadaver lab in Italy by using a Navident in placing zygomatic implants, pterygoid implants, and nasal implants. We will have uh, a dozen of surgeons, which they will be working on a six specimen in exercising how to, to perfectionate those type of, of implants. I tell you this because uh, eventually that might be something of interest uh, for you in the future if that if that is eventually going to be the case but you can imagine that uh, as you can see in this picture placing a pterygoid this is a pterygoid implant you know you see in this case the surgeon plant two pterygoid implants and other implants and therefore you always have bone on the pterygoid plaque so you do have a, a tuber area which is as you know very soft bone but this plaque which is the pterygoid plaque, is always very D1, D2 bone. So you can always anchor a bone on this area. 
So you can even uh, find cases where you place two pterygoid, one on the spine and two nasal. So when you do a severe atrophies, you can place those five implants. And of course, you can postpone the zygomatic implant. So we definitely, we, we suggest that uh, instead of placing a, a quad, uh, instead of placing a four zygomatic implants, you do have plenty of bone opportunity before placing four zygomatic implants. Uh, because there is always volume, bone volume, on the pterygoid plate, on the pterygoid plate, on the nasal bone, and on the spine. You do always have the chance to place five implants in these areas. And of course, it's very difficult uh, placing implants in these areas because uh, a, a pterygoid implant, uh, it's a covered implant. Uh, you cannot see him. But by using Navident, uh, you can easily see, as you can see on this picture, where you're going to be drilling and where you're going to be anchoring your implant. So a pterygoid implant becomes an easy implant with Navident. And the easy solution for your patient, because a pterygoid implant, you're going to place it at your dental office. You don't need to place a pterygoid implant in a hospital with the anesthesia and so on and so forth, like it would be the case for four zygomatic implants. In this case, you operate in your dental office and you provide a solution to your patients, which is a less invasive, both from a biological standpoint and also from an economical standpoint, and very good from a prosthetic standpoint, because you can easily plan a prosthetic, a prosthetic on this implant, because by placing a pterygoid, you provide the second molar to your patient. So contrary to all on four, which is a premolar to premolar, by placing uh, these two pterygoid, you provide from seven to seven. You enable your patient to chew with four molar instead of a four premolar, and that makes a, a huge difference for a patient. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Luca. Thank you to you for your time, and we will touch uh, very, very soon. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Bye bye. Bye.